A Summary and Interpretation of 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson Narrated and Interpreted by Alexander Sandalis Rule 3 Make friends with people who want the best for you If you've ever wondered why some people end up in circles that end up being quite destructive to their character and their habits and their behavior and their entire being then this rule will shed light on how and why that occurs and it also shed light on the on the opposite end as to how some people just end up in circles where it's nothing but positivity, constructive, fulfilling, optimistic momentum forward. Everyone kind of knows somebody that is surrounded by nihilistic, negative people that bring them down. And on the flip side, everybody knows someone who is always surrounded with a positive circle. And so this rule will help explain the old adage of you are the average of the people you spend the most time around. But we first got a question like how do people end up in circles surrounded by people who are not good for them? And Jordan eloquently puts, sometimes when people have a low opinion of their worth or perhaps when they refuse responsibility for their lives, they choose a new acquaintance of precisely the type who proved troublesome in the past. Such people don't believe that they deserve any better, so they don't go looking for it. Or perhaps they don't want the trouble of better. It seems like he's suggesting that when people believe they don't deserve any better, it sounds like that stems from an issue with self-esteem and confidence and a, a litany of childhood and adult trauma that has suffocated kind of their being and their, their, the light that is surrounded by someone's existence. People create their worlds with the tools they have directly at hand. Faulty tools produce faulty results. Repeated use of the same faulty tools produces the same faulty results. It is in this manner that those who fail to learn from the past doom themselves to repeat it. It's partly fate, it's partly inability, it's partly unwillingness to learn, refusal to learn, motivated refusal to learn. These are questions. We don't know the answer. I don't. Jordan suggests he doesn't. But these are just questions provoking thought. Rescuing the damned. Imagine someone not doing well. He needs help. He might even want it. But it is not easy to distinguish between someone truly wanting and needing help and someone who is merely exploiting a willing helper. Now, there's going to be many people, as Robert Greene talks about in his 48 Laws of Power, who exploit you, manipulate you, and prey on your weaknesses for their benefit. And whether people do this consciously or unconsciously is up to the individual. But it will happen. And for those who have a more supplicating nature, those who are more of a selfless type of personality, who are always willing, wanting, and asking to help others, will eventually fall victim or prey to a person like this who will exploit the willing helper. Jordan doesn't directly cite a solution to this issue in this page, and I don't think I have a direct solution for it in one sentence, but I do know that under trying to understand people on a deeper level and, und and observing human behavior, learning about human behavior and the psychology of, of the mind will help. And questioning, fairly questioning people's motives and behavior. I guess that seems like part of an antidote. There are many types of people who have this kind of quote-unquote selfless uh, approach and always try and help others who they perceive as in need. But Jordan points out something very, very important here. And the question is, how do you know that your attempts to pull someone up won't instead bring them down or you further down? Now, this may seem confusing to some people. It's like, oh, I'm helping them. How can helping someone bring them down? Well, that's, that's the thing. Your perception of help may not be the reality of what is actually happening, may not be the reality of the outcome that you perceive, the expectation of what you perceive to happen. And it often is not. Imagine the case of someone supervising an exceptional team of workers, all of them striving towards a collectively held goal. Imagine them hardworking, brilliant, creative, and unified. But the person supervising is also responsible for someone troubled, who is performing poorly elsewhere. In a fit of inspiration, the well-meaning manager moves the problematic person in the midst of his stellar, stellar team, hoping to improve him by example. What happens? 
and the psychological literature is clear on this point. Does the errant interloper immediately straighten up and fly right? No. Instead, the team degenerates. The newcomer remains cynical, arrogant, and neurotic. He complains, he, sh he shirks, he misses important meetings. His low quality work causes delays and must be redone by others. He still gets paid, however, just like his teammates, the hard workers who surround him start to feel betrayed. Why am I breaking myself into pieces striving to finish this project? Each thinks, when my new team member never breaks a sweat. The same thing happens when well-meaning counselors place a delinquent team among comparatively civilized peers. The, de the delinquency spreads, not the stability. Down is a lot easier than up. Now, this is not always the case, however, where Jordan seems to suggest here. But it can happen often, and it's very important to understand. That's a very clear example of how good, w good intentions can end up in catastrophic consequences of impact, uh, poor, product uh, poor productivity and low morale. So Jordan questions the whole intent of the giver, of the helper. Maybe you're saving someone because you're a strong, generous, well put together person who wants to do the right thing. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's actually you. But maybe it's actually not and maybe you're actually lying to yourself. Jordan suggests it's also possible and perhaps more likely that you just want to draw attention to your inexhaustible reserves of compassion and goodwill. Or maybe you're saving someone because you want to convince yourself that the strength of your character is more than just a side effect of your luck and birthplace. Or maybe it's because it's easier to look virtuous when standing alongside someone truly and utterly irresponsible. Now this is an extremely uh, confronting thought to reflect upon. You, I think when I first read it, you have to be extremely honest with yourself and this is obviously very difficult but something that Jordan tries to help people maneuver through and something he's helped me personally maneuver through. It's like facing the chaos and the demons and, and the devil as he would say within you. I definitely relate to the, the first and the last point so the last point being maybe it's easy to look virtuous when standing alongside someone utterly irresponsible. I relate to that. I've felt that before you know that 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 feeling when you maybe you try and help someone who is utterly irresponsible and, and maybe doesn't share the similar character traits that make you uh, unique or or productive and, and, a, and a maybe a, a valuable member to society but by standing alongside this person it makes you feel better about yourself uh, and this is something I've probably done before uh, but it's not productive in the end. It's kind of fake. It's kind of... It gives this fake sense of um, reality. This fake sense of uh, almost virtue, singling, virtue signaling to myself. Kind of putting myself on this moral pedestal. Oh, look at me better than this other person. Look at me helping this person in need. When I'm really just propping up my own self-esteem and, and, and fractured... Uh, uh, character but if you don't realize it's happening you how are you supposed to address it so uh, I want to address it here you know so I can learn to be better if I can't admit it how am I gonna change how's anyone else gonna change and so this is really therapy for myself as well <laughs> a big reason why I do this Jordan gives some more extreme examples of other people who may uh, resonate with this your raging alcoholism makes my binge drinking appear trivial. My long serious talks with you about your badly failing marriage convince both of us that you're doing everything possible and that I am helping you do my utmost. It looks like effort, it looks like progress, but real improvement would require far more from both of you. Are you so sure the person crying out to be saved has not decided a thousand times to accept his lot of pointlessness and worsening suffering simply because it is easier than shouldering any true responsibility? Are you enabling a delusion? Is it possible that your contempt would be more salutary than your pity? People lie to themselves like this all the time. All the time. They compare themselves to someone of a more of an evil to them. Because it makes themselves feel better. As I kind of just alluded to in my own example, I do not have these uh, kind of... I can't relate to the alcoholism or the addictions. I relate to other things, but... The examples are present for so many people. People will compare 
as, as blunt as it is, they'll compare each other's shit. It's like, whose shit stinks more? And they'll feel better that the other person's shit stinks more because it's like, oh, I'm not as bad as this other person. But it's not productive at all. You're not moving forward at all. You're going backwards. You're staying stagnant. And yes, as he says, you're not shouldering any responsibility. It's, it feels like you are. It feels like you are by maybe helping this person have this conversation, but you're not. And people need to realize that. You're not shouldering any responsibility, and that's the problem. You need to face what's in front of you, as confronting as it is, as confronting as these rules and these these just words, these just collections of sounds, uh, are, as, as confronting as they are, you need to, to grow. But maybe you're associating with people who are bad for you, not because it's better for anyone, but because it's easier. You know it. Your friends know it. You're all bound by an implicit contract. One aimed at nihilism and failure and suffering of the stupidest sort. You've all decided to sacri sacrifice the future to the present. Before you help someone, you should find out why that person is in trouble. You shouldn't merely assume that he or she is a noble victim of unjust circumstances and exploitation. It is the most likely explanation, not the most probable. Besides, if you buy that story that everything is everything terrible just happens on its own, with no personal responsibility on that part of the victim, you deny that person all the agency in the past, and by implication in the present and future as well. In this manner, you strip him or her of all the power. You strip him or her of all the power by trying to force your help on them, by trying to fix this person. You need to make an assessment of whether this person truly could uh, uh, take value from your assistance, or are you both just going down further down the, the, the chasm by forcing help upon this person to make yourself feel better? It is far more likely that a given individual has just decided to reject the path upward because of its difficulty. Perhaps that should even be your default assumption when faced with such a situation. Now. T that that last statement that's quite uh, blunt and quite you know confronting to I don't even, not even confronting it might be have this negative connotation in some people's mouths it's like this this bitter aftertaste that yeah some people have just rejected the path forward and maybe that is the first thing you should assume maybe because it's so common maybe because it's more productive to start on that foot maybe it's more productive to start on the on the on this on skepticism rather than assuming good maybe previously when i was younger i had this habit of trying to always fix things people situations friends family and it's probably stemmed from trying to fix my own insecurities i've always trying to trying to address and always work on myself and when i guess when i saw fault in others, it had a two-way effect of reflecting my own fault within them, so I'd see their fault with it reflect in me, and so seeing that fault, seeing that negative trait that I perceived uh, made me feel ill of myself and of the other. And I had this kind of approach to try and fix things, to make, it, I'm quite high in orderliness and industriousness, and so I've been like that for years. Since I was probably 14, 15, and I guess through these character traits, I would try and uh, force them on other people. And oftentimes it didn't work well. And so I, if there's one thing I'd tell my younger self, you know, people always ask this question, I would tell my younger self that you don't need to fix everyone. In fact, you probably don't need to fix anyone except yourself because you're the most broken. And by fixing yourself, which is the most broken, you help bring together other people by your very being, just by, just by being. Now I've kind of learnt through many uh, conflicts and through many situations and opportunities that people tell me, hey, sometimes people just want to talk. Some people just want to be heard, and you don't need to respond with an answer and with a solution. That's what I tell my younger self, and I think that's one of the biggest problems of uh, young men 
is that they always try and fix, especially they try and fix the female's plight, the female's problem, the female's, or whoever, whether you, it doesn't matter who you're with. It's kind of one person generally has the disposition to always try and fix the other and, and, and help the other. I don't want you to feel this pain and suffering. Let me try and help you. No. They have to go through that. That's not your problem to fix. That's not your problem to fix. That's theirs. All you, all you should be there to do is to support. In case they fall down the chasm and they, they put their hands out. They have to put their hands out. If they're not putting their hands out to help, then maybe sometimes you should just let them be. And that's a very hard thing to think about, that you should just let people suffer and in pain, even those as close to you as a, as a, as a partner or as a, as a wife or a husband, as a family member, a dad, a, hus a brother, a sister. You have to sometimes, though, and it's the hardest thing. And Jordan puts into perspective that it's harder not to shoulder a burden. It's easier not to think and not to do and not to care. It's easy to put off things until tomorrow and drown the upcoming months and years in today's cheap pleasures. That's the easy thing to do, and it's what many people succumb to. As the famous Simpsons quote by Homer. That's a problem for future Homer. Man, I don't envy that guy. <laughs> Maybe you've even moved beyond caring about the impending collapse, but don't yet want to admit it. Maybe my help won't rectify anything, can't rectify anything, but it does keep that too terrible, too personal realization temporarily at bay. Maybe your misery is a demand placed on me so that I fail too, so that the gap you so painfully feel between us can be reduced while you degenerate and sink. How do I know that you would refuse to play such a game? How do I know that I am not myself merely pretending to be responsible while pointlessly helping you so that I don't have to do something truly difficult and generally possible? Now Jordan points it back on us. He often talks about the victim, but now he's flicking it back and, and reflecting it back like a mirror. How do you know by trying to help this person that you are, def are deflecting and distracting yourself from your own uh, self-destructive character that you're not facing your own responsibility in fact you're distracting yourself by trying pretending really if you really thought about it, really pretending to help others so then you don't have to do something truly difficult like facing and confronting your demons I am not saying that there is no hope for redemption, but it is much harder to extract someone from the chasm than to lift him from a ditch. And, the, and some chasms are very deep, and there's not much left of the body at the bottom. Maybe I should at least wait to help you, until it's clear that you want to be helped. Carl Rogers, the famous humanistic psychologist, believed it was impossible to start a therapeutic relationship if the person seeking help did not want to improve. Rogers believed it was impossible to convince someone to change for the better. The desire to improve was instead the precondition for progress. The precondition. I've had court-mandated psychotherapy clients. They did not want my help. They were forced to seek it. It did not work. It was a travesty. And this is something I've had to learn the hard way. Some, pe some people you just can't help. And I really kind of, I, I, I tend to agree with Carl Rogers and, and Jordan here, that it's almost, I'm not going to say it's impossible, I'm not going to go that far, but it's almost, it seems, impossible to help someone who doesn't want to be helped. I think there's exceptions to the rule, I do. But in the majority of circumstances, if someone is not putting their hand out, asking for that help, wanting that help, even suggesting it, then I don't even think it's worth it. As harsh as that sounds some, for, for some people, like, if, 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 you're, uh, if, you're, if you're overweight or you're obese and you have a litany of health problems, you're comfortable in your discomfort, you're comfortable in, in the chaos of your life, and you're, you're content with it, you've kind of given up, whatever, I'm gonna die, I can't fix what's already happened now, it's already done, then I tend to not help that type of person. I, I, I'm not going to bear that responsibility on my shoulders to dig someone out of that hole and to carry them out of that hole when, when and necessarily they don't want to be carried out. And even if you do carry them out, they're just going to fall back in it. I think, I believe at this point in my life that the person has to have a desire to improve. And I've seen this time and time again. And when that person has a desire to improve, then you give it. Then you give your all. Then you give them the opportunity that you, you can to help them out of that chasm. 
But I think more people need to understand that and, and put their energy elsewhere to people who do want to be helped. If I stay in an unhealthy relationship with you, perhaps it's because I'm too weak-willed and indecisive to leave, but I don't want to know it. Thus, I continue helping you and console myself with my points of martyrdom. Perhaps, maybe I can then conclude about myself, someone that's self-sacrificing, that willing to help someone that has to be a good person. Not so. It might be just a person trying to look good, pretending to solve what appears to be a difficult problem instead of actually being good and addressing something real. This is, this is kind of a complex thing to conceptualize, but some people are just in relationships with, with kind of unhealthy people, an un unhealthy relationship uh, because it's comforting to them and they're too weak to leave and you need, and it's very hard, oh, fuck. a lot of this is very hard to confront. A lot of this, this rule is about bearing responsibility. Because it feels better to be with someone unhealthy than you. Because you feel healthier around them. Maybe instead of continuing our friendship, I should just go off somewhere, get my act together, and lead by example. And none of this is a justification for abandoning those in real need to pursue your narrow blind ambition. In case, it has to be said. That's the point. It's not a justification for abandoning people. But it needs to be said because it's a reality. It's a reality that drags people down, and not just the person who's who's in the chasm, but it drags other people out who are just trying to help other people in that chasm. And then both of you are fucked. A reciprocal arrangement. Here's something to consider. If you have a friend whose friendship you wouldn't recommend to your sister or your father, your son, why would you have such a friend for yourself? You might say out of loyalty. Well, loyalty is not identical to stupidity. Loyalty must be negotiated fairly and honestly, and I must add, I think loyalty must be earned. Friendship is a reciprocal arrangement. You are not morally obligated to support someone who is making the world a worse place. Quite the opposite. You should choose people who want things to be better, not worse. It's a good thing, not a selfish thing, to choose people who are good for you. It's appropriate and praiseworthy to associate with people whose lives would be improved if they saw your life improve. This is something I talked about in my Instagram. I just, when I was reading this, um, I talked about how this is not mutually exclusive to family, right? You're not morally obligated to support family, a father, a mother, a sister, a brother, who is dragging your life down and making your life more hellish. Just because they're your blood and this person birthed you, this person helped raise you, this person is your brother and your sister. We ha we've attached these grand sentiments to family and, and close friends. And we've put them on this huge pedestal that almost kind of removes them from taking responsibility for the hell that they can put on your life. And I completely disagree with this. Regardless of who it is, family, friends, if someone is adding a bit more hell to my life unnecessarily and a bit more chaos, then I will make a judgment and an assessment of whether, this, uh, whether I have to distance myself from this person and remove this person or whatever the case may be. It, because sometimes it's just not worth it. Sometimes you just can't afford to be dragged down. We're here once, that's it. We're here, we got maybe maybe 80, 90 years, maybe. If your early life doesn't end early because of some accident. I don't, like, that's it. We don't have time for this, man. We don't. We don't have time, we don't have the emotion for it. It's not worth it. And you, by doing so, you create more hellish environment around yourself. And you then you bring more people down around you. You, you cause a cascade of negative consequences. This is, it's quite selfish to actually uh, not remove these poisonous people. Instead, if you surround yourself with people who support your upward aim, they will not tolerate your cynicism and destructiveness. They will instead encourage you when to do good for yourself and others and punish you carefully when, when you do not. These are the types of people you should associate with. This will help bolster your resolve and do what you should do in most appropriate and careful manner. People who are not aiming up will do the opposite. They will offer a former smoker a cigarette and a former alcoholic a beer. So the, the, the really the thing is, surround yourself with people who are aiming up. That's it. Shut the video off. Done. Surround yourself with people who are aiming up. And if you can remove that one poisonous person who is aiming down, then you will be better for it. Regardless of if it's family, friends, or blood. Regardless. Maybe you need to take more consideration and care into the decision you make. Agreed. 
but it should not admonish them from taking responsibility for their life and your life. And often you're going to find people who are going to drag you down because your new improvements about yourself cast faults in them in an even dimmer light. So when you dare inspire upward, you reveal the inadequacy of the present and the promise of the future. You disturb others in the depths of their souls, where they understand that their cynicism and immobility are unjustifiable. And that is one of the biggest reasons why people uh, are confronted with uh, this confusing behavior by other people. When you try and do good, right? You try and become a better person. You're trying to aim upward, right? And you're confronted with, with people and weird behavior. It's like... Why are these people acting this way? Why are these people trying to drag me down? Why are these people spreading rumors about me and lies about me? You're casting faults, it's like a mirror. Your aiming upward is like a mirror reflecting upon them their faults that because they are aiming downwards or if they are aiming downwards rather. So don't think it's easier to surround yourself with a good healthy person than with a bad unhealthy person because it's not a good healthy person is an ideal it requires strength and daring to stand up near such a person have some humility have some courage use your judgment and protect yourself from the too uncritical compassion and pity make friends with people who want the best for you so this rule is a remedy for those who want to get out of the hell around them or have a little less hell in their life but only if they want it only if they're reaching their hand out It's about these people getting to the point where they want people around them who want the best for them. Who want people around them who are aiming upward.